This is East Asia Tonight. Good evening, I'm Otelia Edwards. Tonight's top stories. Japan's Prime Minister Kishida facing scandal and sinking polls announces his resignation, saying it's the best move for the public and a necessary step to prove party reform. So, who's in the running to replace Mr. Kishida as leader of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party? And what qualities will the LDP demand? We turn to a political expert for insight. Plus, political uncertainty in Thailand Thailand as well. Seta Tawisin has been removed as Prime Minister after being found guilty of violating the Constitution. And a stark warning from the world's biggest steel maker. China's steel sector is battling its worst crisis and companies need to prioritize preserving cash over making profit. Ahead on East Asia tonight, scorching weather affecting large parts of the region this summer. We journey into concrete jungle Hong Kong to see how its outdoor workers are coping with a heat wave. And we also look into Malaysia's plan to join BRICS, a grouping of emerging nations that includes China and Russia. What will Malaysia gain and will it benefit ASEAN as well? A Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will not be running for re-election in the Liberal Democratic Party's leadership race next month. It paves the way for a new Prime Minister to take the reins. A 67-year-old says he made this decision considering what's best for the public and also what's necessary to show that the party is changing. A series of political scandals have marred the LDP's reputation and Mr Kishida says he must take responsibility. ま、所属議員が起こした重大な事態について組織の長としてこの the move will end a three-year term during which Mr. Kishida pushed for higher wages and ramped up defence spending. Now, as the country's eighth longest-serving post-war leader, he led Japan out of the COVID pandemic with massive stimulus spending. Well, the next president of the Liberal Democratic Party is virtually assured of becoming Japan's prime minister due to the party's majority in parliament. So who could replace Mr. Kishida? Well, let's uh, take a look at some of the potential contenders. According to a recent opinion poll, Shigeru Ishiba, a seasoned politician with a strong background as former secretary general of the ruling LDP and ex-defense minister, has emerged as the public's top choice despite his previous unsuccessful bids for leadership. Now, another possible candidate is Taro Kono, who lost to Mr. Kishida in the last party election and uh, is currently Minister for Digital Transformation and has served as Foreign Minister and Defence Minister in the past. And uh, experts say that Mr. Kono has long been popular with the public and is seen as an outsider who could potentially revamp the LDP's image. Now, a party heavyweight that could be in the running is Toshimitsu Motegi, the LDP's current Secretary General. He has served in many cabinet posts, including as foreign, trade and economy ministers. Well, the country could also see its first female premier if Yoko Kamikawa gets chosen for the top job. Well, she's currently Japan's foreign minister and has also served as the country's justice minister. Now, uh, let's look at another potential female candidate, and that's uh, Economic Security Minister Sanae Takaichi. She's known for her conservative views, and uh, she ran in the last election in 2021. Also, the son of former Premier Junichiro Koizumi could also be in the running. Shinjiro Koizumi is a former environment minister and was first elected to Japan's lower house back in 2009. Now, Japan's former health minister and chief cabinet secretary could also be considered for the premiership. Katsunobu Kato is a seven-term lawmaker who helped guide Japan through the COVID-19 pandemic.
And for more, we are joined now by CNA's Mitch Ishida, speaking to us live from Tokyo. So, uh, Mitch, what's next for uh, Mr. Kishida and the LDP? Well, um, Mr. Kishida in his news conference uh, this morning um, said that he is still keen to revise the post-war constitution. He said he wants to specifically include the role of the self-defense force. Japan's Article 9 renounced war, and some scholars call the presence of the self-defense force a violation of the constitution. So in the event of contingencies, Mr. Kishida wants to include in the preface the role of the self-defense force. And Japan has not revised its constitution Constitution, which came into effect in 1947. Uh, he also said he wants some time to reorganize his thoughts on policy. It's to be seen whether he will choose to be a kingmaker or will try to return to power in the future. But next for the party, it's about electing a new president. Uh, because Mr. Kishida made clear he is not running, his cabinet ministers, party aides will be free to run. And if Mr. Kishida was running, it would have been seen as a betrayal if his uh, cabinet m uh, members ran. Now, for the public, the top favorite is and has always been the former LDP Secretary General and Defense Minister Shigeru Ishiba, uh, but he is not popular within the ruling party. Now, number two at this point is Shinjiro Koizumi, former Environment Minister and, as you know, son of former Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi. Okay. Oh, Michu, I guess the timing of this announcement might have uh, appeared as a surprise to some people. But in the meantime, what exactly are the political parties uh, saying? Well, um, opposition parties here see the LD po LDP politics um, in trouble. Um, Kenta Izumi, who is the leader of the largest opposition party, Constitutional Democrats, said that even though uh, Mr. Kishida will no longer head the LDP, uh, he thinks LDP will not change, referring to its political fund scandal. He thinks Mr. Kishida has given up on political reform. The Constitutional Democrats is also holding a party presidential election in September, specifically on September 23rd. And the winner is expected to face the new LDP president in the prime ministerial election in both houses of parliament. Now, Mr. Izumi's Constitutional Democrats has been doing well in local elections this year. Uh, it's said to be helped by the Kishida cabinet's low approval rating, according to media polls. So who their next leader will be crucial to the opposition party, too. Um, some political watchers predict if public approval rating jumps, uh, for the new prime minister, uh, he might go ahead and dissolve parliament for a snap election as early as this October. Okay. And we'll uh, certainly be looking out for that. Thanks very much, Mitsuo Ishida, speaking to us in Tokyo. Right, let's uh, have a quick look now at how Japanese financial markets reacted to Mr. Kishida's announcement. While they typically do not react well to political uncertainty, analysts say that the impact of Mr. Kishida's decision to step down should be limited. The Nikkei ending with a 0.6% gain, erasing an earlier loss in response to Mr. Kishida's announcement. The topics also closed higher. As for the yen weakening, uh, weakened to a touch to about 147 against the dollar, it surged to a seven-month high of about 141.7 on Monday of last week. And now for more on uh, what Mr. Kishida's impending exit means, both domestically and abroad, we now speak with uh, Tomohiko Taniguchi, a specially appointed professor at the University of Tsukuba, and he's also a special advisor at the Fujitsu Future Studies Center. Well, thanks again for joining us on East Asia tonight, Professor. So um, what would you say? I know you have a lot of opinions about this, but what would you say was the main driver uh, behind Mr. Kishida's early exit? I mean, you think it was his choice or was he pushed out by his own party? The main motivation that he mentioned during his press conference is the fact that uh, a lot of blood has been shed within the party among his party colleagues simply because he has purged a big number of party colleagues of his own due to this uh, supposedly minor financial scandal that involved not a single Japanese yen of taxpayers' money. So uh, he... Uh, had to uh, uh, purge those members, and then he said he felt that he would be responsible, and he was thinking of when uh, the next timing would be 
to uh, uh, step down as the leader of the party, i.e. as prime minister. Well, it's still secret that the LDP's uh, corruption scandal has impacted uh, Kishida's approval ratings, and you've talked about how he's perched a lot of uh, party members of his own. Uh, aside from that, what were the other key moments that um, sealed his fate? In order for the Japanese prime minister to boost his political capital, sometimes he needs to dissolve Japanese parliament, and he has fumbled the ball a number of times. He has uh, failed to seize the moment when uh, he was able to dissolve the parliament and call for snap elections. For his party colleagues, he appeared to be tone deaf when it comes to uh, choosing the right moment. I think he has lost trust from among party colleagues. I think that's been the primary motivation behind him. So, uh, yeah, Professor, you've said that uh, the Prime Minister Kishida, he fumbled the ball. Um, he's failed in that moment. Um, but in terms of the party as a whole, LDP, I mean, do you think that Kishida's early exit would help restore the public's trust uh, towards the LDP? Judging from the uh, gross unpopularity, if you uh, see what the polls say, of the Japanese opposition parties, there is a fair chance for the LDP to regain uh, popularity from the Japanese public. But it'll depend on what sort of debate and discussions you will see uh, among the party leadership, uh, party leader contenders. Uh, the election is due in September, so the next month is going to be very much crucial for the uh, uh, prime minister hopefuls to show to the nation and to the party grassroots members how capable the, uh, uh, he or she is in uh, seeking office. Mm. And, uh, Professor, let's just talk about, you know, the foreign policies uh, that Kishida's, um, you know, taken care of. And I suppose, you know, he has his allies, U.S. and South Korea, for instance. How do you think Kishida's departure, what would that mean for Japan's relationship uh, with these allies? And, and I guess, how is it going to impact the regional uh, security, if at all? There is nervousness, I would imagine, among those uh, alliance country leaders uh, in the United States, in Australia, in uh, South Korea, and so on, because some uh, contenders uh, have shown uneasiness to work closely with the United States, and some have shown easiness uh, instead to work with China. So uh, always the Japanese prime minister has to uh, walk a fine, uh, tight rope uh, in um, uh, uh, choosing Japanese direction, but uh, objectively speaking, Japan's options are not many in number, and the path forward is narrow. So overall, uh, there is going to be very uh, little uh, differences between now and the future uh, when it comes to Japan's foreign policy. Hmm. But, Professor, you did say that there is, from now till uh, September, there is a small chance that LDP uh, can potentially regain the trust uh, and popularity as well. So, um, in the search for the next LDP uh, leader, as that heats up, what are some of the key qualities you think the party will be looking for? Mr. Kishida has been very much uh, ill capable in communicating his ideas and thoughts to the Japanese public. And that's a very good lesson that he has left. Uh, the next leader must be very much a good communicator in telling the Japanese and through the Japanese to the wider world what Japan is going to do, uh, what, which country, what country Japan is going to look like, how Japan's economy is going to be boosted. So uh, clarity is the first and the second and third most important caveat for the next prime minister. Well, you've mentioned clarity, being able to communicate, um, being some key factors here. You know, earlier we listed a whole bunch of potential contenders. Um, so, Professor, who is your top pick? I've got no crystal ball here, but uh, uh, those so-called popular uh, candidates, uh, ironically, are not so much popular among the party 
uh, members, party uh, con uh, parliamentary uh, members, and uh, the grassroots vote is important, but parliamentary uh, members' vote is as important. So, uh, first of all, the uh, candidate who is going to stand for the election must uh, put together 20 uh, people, 20 uh, parliamentarians who recommend him, sh him or her uh, for the uh, office. So that's going to be the first uh, most important litmus test to judge the leadership caliber of the contenders you're looking at. Okay. And and uh, finally, Professor, I know you've had some stern, pretty harsh words for uh, Mr. Kishida, uh, but how do you think, um, you know, he, his three-year premiership will be remembered in Japan? He has done a number of good things. The only thing is that he has failed to tell the public that those policies have come out of his inner self. And that's uh, the uh, failure uh, for Mr. Kishida. But objectively speaking, historians, future historians will be kinder because he has done a number of uh, good things like uh, mending fences uh, between South Korea and Japan and strengthening Japan's international uh, status with uh, other uh, G7 colleagues. So those are the uh, achievements he has done. I always enjoy this uh, candid conversation. Uh, thanks so very much, Professor Tomohiko Tanaguchi, for your time joining us from Tokyo. A time now for a short break, but coming up next on East Asia tonight, we turn our focus to Thailand, where the Constitutional Court has removed Prime Minister Seta Tawisin from office over a serious breach of ethics. And Chinese internet and gaming giant Tencent out with a strong earnings report. Its net profit beating forecasts, while revenue jumped 8%. We'll get you all the details. Thailand in fresh political turmoil after former Prime Minister Seta Tawisin was removed from office in an ethics probe. The Constitutional Court found Mr. Seta guilty over his nomination of a cabinet minister with a criminal record. Well, Thai law prohibits those with a criminal conviction from holding a public post. The judges ruled that Mr. Seta breached the Constitution and violated ethical standards. The now former PM insists that he abided by the law and conducted protocol vetting. And uh, for more, we are joined now by Saksit Sasambat, live at the government house in Bangkok. So, um, Saksit, I believe uh, the Prime Minister Seta, he just held a news conference uh, right after the verdict. Um, what were some of the things that he said? Yes, indeed, Oteli. The Prime Minister, or rather now ex-Prime Minister, Seta Tawi Sin, uh, came out very immediately, quite after he was dismissed by the Constitutional Court to the press and held a very short press conference, basically saying that uh, he is accepting the outcome of the verdict, that he insists that he has done nothing wrong, everything in accordance to the law. And let's hear a little bit more what else he said. <laughs> พยายามทําทุกอย่างให้ถูกต้องนะครับมีความตั้งใจจริงในการทํางานยึดมั่นโดยในอุดมการณ์ของการทํางานด้วยความซื่อสัตย์สุจริตและฟังความคิดเห็
Well, first of all, government house behind me doesn't have a tenant, so we don't have a prime minister. Uh, we need, uh, we do have a caretaker cabinet now that has to decide on a caretaker prime minister. Um, there would be next in line would be deputy prime minister Pum Tamwe Chiatai, who is also the commerce minister. He is currently out of country right now, so he needs to race back here to Thailand in order to take up office. Then, uh, of course, we also need a new prime minister. That is up to parliament. They have to vote as soon as possible on a new prime minister based on the list of prime minister candidates that was submitted for last year's election. Now, the Thai party, they still have um, two, uh, an, uh, one or two arrows in the quiver in form of Petong Tan Shinawat, but there, it's also possible that the leaders of the other parties, especially of the coalition um, partners of this government, they might angle a takeover. They might have ambitions to become the next prime minister, but this also means that the whole cabinet itself needs to be revamped as well. We will definitely see a lot of new faces and, as I mentioned before, a new tenant behind me in government house. So what does it mean for Thai politics in general? Let's not forget, this is the second constitutional court verdict in just as many weeks. Last week, the opposition moved forward party, the party that has won the most seats but was blocked from forming a government, they were dissolved, and the Prime Minister now, they are now dissolved too. So it doesn't bode very well for Thailand. Uh, a lot of social media reactions were very incensed already last week, and they're even more incensed now, seeing that the powers of politics is not taking place here at Government House, it's not taking place at the polls, but seemingly it's taking place in places that are not, um, and not, not under the control of the people, in this case by the judiciary and by the courts. Right, quite a lot of political uncertainty at this point. Um, well, thanks very much for that report. Saksit Sambot speaking to us in Bangkok. And uh, it's over to Roland Lim now from CNA's business desk uh, for more uh, business news. And uh, Roland, we are getting some pretty stark warning uh, on the state of China's steel industry. Is that right? Right, Oteli. China's steel industry facing its worst crisis yet. The world's biggest steel producer, that's China Pao Steel Group, likened the crisis to a severe winter, which will be longer and colder than expected. Now, in a statement, the firm highlighted the need to preserve cash as being more important than making profit. Pao produces about 7% of the world's steel. Now, China's steel market, also the world's largest, is going through a severe stress as the property downturn and weaker factory activity have battered domestic demand. Now, with steel prices at multi-year lows, mills are racking up losses. Baowu's stark message will likely cause unease for its rival, the rest of the world, who are already grappling with a flood of Chinese exports. Now, China's steel industry survived the last two slumps, that's during the global financial crisis, and in 2015 due to massive stimulus from the government. However, a similar rescue doesn't appear likely in President Xi Jinping's efforts to reshape the economy. Now, Tencent Holdings' latest quarterly profit beating forecasts. It also managed to reverse two straight quarters of contraction for its games business. Revenue growth at the world's biggest games publisher sped up after the blockbuster summer release of Dungeon and Fighter Mobile. Net profit surged to $6.65 billion for the second quarter, handily beating estimates of about $5.58 billion. Revenues rose 8% to $22.5 billion, narrowly missing consensus. Tencent's ubiquitous WeChat app also powering new growth, bolstering advertising sales. Transactions for virtual items and e-commerce purchases help to drive growth as well. Because of its strength in these high-margin businesses, the Sunshine-based firm may be in a better position than rivals Alibaba and JD.com, both of which will report their quarterly earnings this week. China's biggest internet players rely on a confident consumer. However, the country's stuttering economic growth and challenges such as a property slump and high youth unemployment are hurting the appetite for big-ticket purchases. The world's biggest contract electronics maker, that's Taiwan's Foxconn, continuing to ride the AI boom. It reported a 6% rise in second quarter net profit and kept its forecast that full-year revenue will grow substantially. A net profit for the Apple supply rose to $1.09 billion in the April to June period, beating estimates. It's the fourth straight quarterly gain in profit for the company. And that's due to the release of new products from, from its clients, including Apple, ahead of the holiday season. The Taiwanese company says its AI server business has brought, quote, strong growth momentum to its overall revenue. Now, these account for more than 40% of its server business.
Foxconn's efforts to diversify its business have led it to play an increasingly important role in the building of AI servers for U.S. tech giants like Amazon and NVIDIA. Now, Foxconn announced it would start delivering NVIDIA's GB200 chips in the fourth quarter in small volumes, which would rise further in early 2025. Shares in Foxconn traded as Hon High Precision closed nearly 2.5% high ahead of the results. Investors betting on the AI boom have already sent the company's stock prices soaring 77% this year, outperforming the broader Taiwan market. Over in Japan, its blue chip firms could see their net profit fall for the first time in four years. Now, that's as the yen strengthens against the greenback, making Japanese exports more expensive in dollar terms. A cloudier outlook for the U.S. economy also threatening to dampen the firm's profit growth. Nikkei Asia analyzed the forecast earnings of about 1,060 companies listed on Tokyo Exchange's prime market. Now, it found that these firms are likely to report a total net profit of $316.1 billion for the current fiscal year, ending March of 2025. Now, that's down 1% from fiscal 2023. Autos, steel, oil and electric power firms expect to see profits drop 20% or more. Losing the boost previously provided by the yen's depreciation is a major factor. Now, the average assumed exchange rate in earnings forecast is about 145 yen to the dollar. That's on par with fiscal 2023. In comparison, the yen averaged around 136 to the dollar in the preceding fiscal year. And you're up to date with the business news. Otelli, back to you. Thanks as always, Roland. Well, we're going to go for a short break now, but uh, coming up next on East Asia tonight, Hong Kong's extraordinary heat wave laying bare the disparities between the haves and the have-nots. Our correspondent Deborah Wong joins us after the break. Japan's Prime Minister Kishida, facing scandal and sinking polls, announces his resignation, saying it's the best move for the public and a necessary step to prove a party reform. Plus, political uncertainty in Thailand as well. Setha Tawisin has been removed as Prime Minister after being found guilty of violating the Constitution. And the world's biggest steelmaker issuing a stark warning that the sector in China is battling its worst ever crisis. And circling back to our top story this hour, Japan's Prime Minister announcing his resignation. Fumio Kishida won't be standing for re-election as head of the ruling LDP next month. Well, his decision ends a three-year term marred by a political funding scandal and low public approval ratings. CNA's Michio Ishida looks back. By stepping down... Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida sought to take responsibility for the mishandling of unreported political donations to his Liberal Democratic Party collected during fundraising parties. That scandal translated into poor public approval ratings for his cabinet, based on media polls, lingering around 20 percent. He said his party needed to reinvent itself. For that, a change was needed. Yes, okay. ま、自民党が変わることを示す。え、最初の一歩は私が身を引くことであります。え、私は来たる総裁選には必須はいたしません。Mr. Kishida added that he chose his timing to announce he is not seeking re-election, as his diplomatic schedule is now settled. He wrapped up a key diplomatic mission on Tuesday with a phone conversation with his Mongolian counterpart after skipping a planned three-nation tour to Central Asia last week. He canceled the trip due to an unprecedented mega-earthquake alert issued by the Japan Meteorological Agency following a magnitude 7.1 quake off Kyushu last Thursday. Mr. Kishida's term is marked by several achievements in foreign policy. He mended ties with South Korea to a positive level not seen since Japan's colonization of the country, allowing deeper security cooperation to counter the threat posed by North Korea. And he brought ties with the Philippines to a quasi-alliance level amid China's growing assertiveness in the disputed South China Sea. Under Mr. Kishida, 
Japan also strengthened its alliance with the U.S. further by enhancing security cooperation and unveiled its biggest military buildup since World War II, approving a hike in defense spending as the country faces a more complex security environment. Last year, as chair of the group of seven industrialized nations, Mr. Kishida hosted leaders in Hiroshima, where an atomic bomb was used against the civilian population for the first time and called for a world without nuclear weapons, as Russia threatened its use and North Korea conducted nuclear tests. He warned that East Asia could be the next Ukraine. Domestically, he pushed for the use of nuclear power on the back of rising fuel prices and promotion of carbon neutrality. Despite lingering concerns following the Fukushima disaster more than a decade ago, he also gave the green light for Fukushima plant to release treated radioactive water into the sea, a key step in decommissioning the reactors, despite opposition from China. A tragic incident which shifted into criticism towards his party was the assassination of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in July 2022. The incident revealed Abe and the LDP's deep ties to the controversial Unification Church. Mr. Kishida said in his news conference on Wednesday that he still has work to do. He wants to revise Japan's post-war constitution, promote political reform, and support the recovery of Noto Peninsula from the New Year's Day earthquake. And he will need to prepare for any further quakes and a typhoon expected to hit the Tokyo area on Friday. Michio Ishida, CNA, Tokyo. Well, it's been a scorching summer in Hong Kong. The city has issued a very hot warning advisory on nearly every day of this month. And that's when temperatures are higher than 33 degrees Celsius. They reached 39 degrees Celsius at one point in some districts. Well, the Hong Kong Observatory has predicted that 2024 could be one of the hottest years on record for the territory. And uh, low-wage outdoor workers seem to be bearing the brunt of it. CNA's Deborah Wong has the story. If you're heading out in Hong Kong, don't forget your umbrella, because if there isn't a sudden downpour, it gets intensely hot. For those who work in the outdoor environment, they are consistently exposed to very high uh, outdoor temperature, and that would lead to uh, severe dehydration to them if they could not replenish their fluids uh, adequately. And uh, that could lead to uh, heat-related signs and symptoms like uh, uh, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, or even heat stroke. In response to soaring temperatures, Hong Kong introduced a three-tiered heat stress warning system last May. Employers of outdoor workers are encouraged to schedule rest breaks ranging from 15 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on the alert. Well, usually the, we have to provide some shade area for them and also some cool drinking water. And they have a, a cap with the, uh, some flap at the back to protect the, the, the neck. Some of them with a mobile uh, vest with some fan inside so that the people when they're working, they can uh, lower their, their body temperature and also their ventilation inside the construction site. But a string of excessive heat warnings could potentially delay construction timelines, extending waits for public housing and infrastructure projects. I think delay is uh, unavoidable if the heat waits just continuously. Uh, every day we have four to five warnings issued by the government. The, the, the only thing we can do is to provide a predictable rest uh, period so that we can time our own progress. Then we can make it up in the autumn or winter time if the uh, construction period permits. Registered construction workers also receive vouchers for health checkups, but low-wage gig workers face a tougher time. They are the self-employed workers. They do not physically have an employer. And some workers, they may need to work in the most uh, remote areas. For example, the cleaners on the streets or even in the countryside. So they may not receive the tangible support from their employer, like the physical rest stations in a fixed uh, work locations. The Hong Kong Red Cross mobilizes teams to set up mobile rest stations across Hong Kong whenever the observatory issues a hot weather advisory. So far, it's given out 1,100 summer kits this year, compared to 700 in 2022. 
so of course we provide them with a set of summer work kit which is uh, including one portable fans, some electrolyte strings, one big bottle of water and a small amount of cash vouchers for them to buy some necessities in the supermarkets. So we take it as a starting point to tell them the information about the extreme hot weather um, signals and also the uh, knowledge how to help themselves if they feel some sicknesses. In the spirit of community building, the non-profit also encourages business owners and residents to provide relief for this group whenever possible. It can be in the form of just offering water or much-needed shade. Deborah Wong, CNA, Hong Kong. Uh, for more, CNA's Deborah Wong, she joins us live now from Hong Kong. So Deborah, help us understand this. Uh, what exactly makes this year's heat wave in Hong Kong uh, any different and uh, how worried should we be? Well, you know, when the temperature reaches 33 degrees Celsius and above, the Hong Kong Observatory uh, will issue a very hot weather warning. And the data is concerning because the number of heat warnings issued by the Hong Kong Observatory, or what we call the HKO, that has gone up over the last decade. So in 2013, there were 12 alerts, while in 2023, there were 42 alerts. And in just this month alone, almost every single day, we're receiving an alert on our phone uh, warning us about the very hot weather and aside from how the excessive heat um, has impacted outdoor workers, like what you saw earlier in the story, you know, another vulnerable, another vulnerable group that we're looking at is uh, the senior citizens. Uh, distress calls have gone up, even logging about 1,600 calls a day, uh, every day since the start of August. And many of these calls come from seniors who live alone. So I did ask Dr. Eric Lai, the researcher that we interviewed in the story, to just explain the science behind it as to why this group is uh, specifically impacted. Here's what he said. Our body needs to react in order to maintain our body within optimum temperature. So in order to react to that, our body has to pump more blood to the skin. Uh, so to make more sweat or make more heat loss to the environment. And uh, by doing so, our heart need to pump stronger such that we can distribute more blood to the skin. And uh, in so doing, it creates extra burden to the to, to our cardiovascular system. So it is particularly burdensome for those uh, who has the underlying history of cardiovascular diseases, especially those uh, uh, who are in the older age. You know, in fact, researchers in another university, the Hong Kong University, found that heat waves over the last decade contributed to more than 1,600 deaths, and that's a worrying figure. So NGOs and researchers are saying that more needs to be done aside from just public education. And what they're doing is they're calling for energy subsidies. They're also calling for more medical staff to be mobilized and deployed, especially during the hot season. And Deborah, this heat wave has brought up questions about social inequality. Uh, can you help us understand what's the situation like in Hong Kong? Well, Hong Kong is incredibly dense. The urban space here is so dense and nowhere is as dense as its infamous, infamous subdivided houses. So these homes are often in old buildings, they're in old industrial buildings as well, with little to no uh, ventilation. They're usually... Um, also in very have very cramped environments and also serious uh, health um, serious fire hazards. And Dr. Lai uh, broke down the situation for me to explain why this kind of situation uh, does lead to more heat related stresses. Here's what he says. In Hong Kong, we have got a very wide wealth inequality, which also means that we um, have some groups of population living in quite deprived. Uh, um, neighborhood and uh, in very poor housing. The local team of research have found that uh, for the heat related mortality, they're more concentrated in the uh, lower income neighborhood than those who are in the uh, high income neighborhood. So, which means that the, uh, the health impact of extreme hot weather is not equally felt across the city. So Dr. Lai and fellow researchers, you know, they've been telling me that they've collected uh, data points uh, on where the most vulnerable residents uh, live. So what they've done is to create a sort of map and they're going to take that information to the district councils, uh, to the NGOs like Red Cross so that they can offer timely assistance. And the responders will then step up home visits. So aside from just uh, 
informing these residents about what they can do to prevent heat stroke. They're also going into these houses to do up some home modifications to improve the ventilation. And in some cases, even providing them with uh, some sort of cooling system. But, you know, at the end of the day, all these efforts are largely driven by the NGO. So uh, these people are saying that there is still a need for government-led initiatives uh, or subsidies even, especially as Hong Kong gets hotter. Back to you. All right. Well, you stay cool, uh, Deborah. Thanks for that report. Deborah Wong speaking to us from Hong Kong. Now, a fierce heat wave also rolling or roiling residents in North Korea, including the capital, Pyongyang. Weather officials say the mercury could hit 37 degrees Celsius. The soaring temperatures come as North Korea is still trying to recover from heavy flooding in areas near China. More than 4,000 homes were swarmed in the regions of Sinuju and Uiju late last month. The weather agency has ramped up forecasting efforts to provide timely information so that regional authorities can take necessary measures. Well, across the border, South Korea not spared the scorching heat either. Seoul experiencing its 24th consecutive tropical night. Well, that's when the temperature does not drop below 25 degrees Celsius. The heat wave is set to continue into next week, so the country will likely break the century-old record of 26 straight tropical nights by Saturday. Seoul says that 21 people have died from heat-related causes this year. Electricity demand also hit an all-time high this week as locals turned to air conditioners and fans. Now, those in North Korea may not be as lucky. Most residents do not have air conditioning and power shortages are common. One researcher warns that the number of deaths in the north could be many times higher than in the south. Well, the Pacific Island nation of Kiribati is holding its first round of parliamentary elections. Topping voter concerns, the increasing cost of living, rising sea levels and the government's pivot to China. Kiribati is a nation of around 120,000 people and it's considered strategic because it's relatively close to Hawaii and controls large swathes of the Pacific Ocean. Kiribati has drawn closer to China under President Taneti Maumu, cutting relations with Taiwan in 2019. Beijing has in turn sent teams of police to support local law enforcement, raising security concerns from the U.S. and Australia. A former president says closer ties to China has also pushed Kiribati to become more authoritarian. The country no longer has an appeals court system after the government suspended the chief justice, among other judges. Kiribati's newly elected lawmakers will be putting forward candidates for president, who will then be elected in September or October. A U.S. Army intelligence analyst has pleaded guilty to charges of selling military secrets to China. Corbin Schultz was charged in March over claims that he had disclosed information on national defence, exported technical data without a licence and bribed a public official. Having top-secret clearance, Schultz conspired with an individual living in Hong Kong whom he suspected of being associated with the Chinese government. Among many sensitive documents Schultz handed over, one included lessons learned by the U.S. Army from the Russia-Ukraine war and how Washington could use these hacks to support Taiwan's defense. The Department of Justice says Schultz received approximately $42,000 for sending dozens of unclassified military documents. The FBI says it's not the first time an American abused their position to disclose classified information to the Chinese government. Just a week ago, Wang Shujin, a Chinese-American academic, was convicted of illegally acting as a foreign agent and sharing information about pro-democracy activists based in New York to Beijing's intelligence services. Well, coming up next on East Asia Tonight, what's riding on Malaysia's push to join the BRICS group? And what risks could the move bring? Malaysia plans to join the BRICS grouping of emerging nations amid growing geopolitical uncertainties, including U.S.-China tensions. Well, the economic benefits of joining the bloc are hard to quantify, but economists are saying that Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim may want to seize the platform to expand the reach of ASEAN when Malaysia takes over the chairmanship of the Southeast Asian grouping next year. Melissa Goh has a report. One. For weeks now, Prime Minister Anwar has been hopping on the country's planned move to join BRICS. 
Established in 2009 as a platform for emerging economies, the bloc initially included Brazil, Russia, India and China, while South Africa joined a year later. The bloc has since expanded to include Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran and the UAE. We should be confident enough to determine our course of action, our priorities, our strategic interests defined on our own terms. Analysts said Ms. Anwar's decision to join the bloc is understandable, given the huge economic potential of BRICS country, which now contribute about a third of the world's economy and account for one-fifth of global trade. Global GDP growth is forecasted for about 3.2%, 3.3%. BRIC countries, the existing members, is close to about 36 Of course, with countries like India and China a bit further up the curve. Now, when you have more than um, 4 billion of the world's population, you know, a little bit over a third of global GDP and further potential, then you start to see why it could become a very formidable block. But just how much will Malaysia gain economically from joining BRICS is debatable, economists said, although geopolitically it makes sense. If there is no trade facilitations, I don't foresee any tangible benefit economically. But at the same time, in terms of security, two of them in the Security Council, which have veto power, we have a seat at a powerful block to promote our interests. With total exports and imports of goods and services accounting for over 140% of its economy, Malaysia needs to tread carefully amid intense rivalries between China and the US, two of its largest trading partners and investors. Now, staying fiercely independent and actively neutral is what Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim insists that Malaysia needs in order to continue to do business with the superpowers. The reality is that while Malaysia sends these signals um, with with regards to BRICS, it also has a very, very strong trading and investment relationship with other important power blocks of the world, including the United States and the EU. And Malaysia as a nation has also always been pragmatic in looking out for its geopolitical interests in ways that will keep us uh, safe and productive and what that entails is essentially um, ensuring relationships with all superpowers of the world are maintained. And the Prime Minister appears to be doing precisely that. In mid-June, he welcomed Chinese Premier Li Qiang, who visited Malaysia to mark 50 years of bilateral relations. And later that month, he met the American ambassador and tech giants from the US and Europe. In July, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov called on him, and Mr. Anwar formally submitted the application to join BRICS and plans to visit Russia in September. And with Malaysia taking over the ASEAN Championship next year, analysts said Mr. Anwar would want to seize all platforms to speak up for ASEAN and the developing world in a powerful voice against economic injustices. Melissa Go, CNA, Kuala Lumpur. Finally, thousands of Singaporeans cheered on their homegrown Olympians, including kite foil bronze medalist Max Maeda, fresh from the Paris Games. Well, the athletes travelled in an open-top bus around the city, all in high spirits. Well, even a heavy downpour could not dampen the celebrations. Ali Vamsha was on the bus with the team and uh, caught all the action. Even as rain poured and the ponchos are out, it was full steam ahead for celebrations as Singapore's Olympians travel through the heart of the city. The fans came out in their thousands, stretching from Chinatown to Victoria Street. There were the young and the young at heart. The curious and the inspired. We are here to see Max. He's very brave. These sort of things don't happen uh, on a daily basis and when we have a champion and uh, all the others who participated, we should come and support. They came back from Paris 2024 with um, amazing achievements. It not, ne- not necessarily had to be a podium finish or even a gold medal. It can be just breaking national records and this is something that us Singaporeans can be proud of. In the crowd, two parents were beaming with pride. 
I'm very happy, of course. I think he's a very lucky boy that he gets so many people coming out to see him. I didn't expect it, yeah. Joining Mado were nine other athletes, including husband and wife badminton pair Terry He and Jessica Tan, sprinter Mark Lewis and swimmer Gan Jing Hui. It's beautiful to see. I mean, like I said, my heart melted and, and I, I'm very happy to see that people enjoyed the fact that we as Team Singapore came through and said uh, and gave a wave hello to everyone. That was pretty fun. It was quite uh, boisterous. Yeah, and it was nice to see everyone come along the ride. It was very heartwarming to see all the Singaporeans rally together to support Team Singapore. And, and yeah, it was, it was an experience that I will never forget. Now that the bus parade for Singapore's Olympic athletes has come to an end, many of them will no doubt be taking a much-deserved break. But you can bet that the Los Angeles 2028 Games won't be too far from their plans. Oh, well done and congratulations Team Singapore. And that does it for Wednesday's edition of East Asia Tonight. Thanks for watching.